Recently, we at the Canadian Student Space Initiative have been testing and experimenting different aspects of building and designing small-scale hybrid rocket engines. However, we not only want you, the viewer, to be interested, but knowledgeable in rocketry and space exploration. Today, we will share with you some key knowledge on how hybrid rocket engines work and how to build one yourself as an experiment. First, before we get into any detail, what exactly is a hybrid rocket engine? And what makes it a hybrid? To get there, we need to look at a more general picture first. One of the most common types of rocket engines is the bipropellant rocket. This much broader category of rocket engines include the main engines on all three stages of this mighty Saturn V rocket that brought humans to the moon, the main engines on the space shuttle, and all common hybrid rocket engines. And as the word root bi, meaning two, would suggest, a bipropellant rocket requires two propellants. Now, propellants are just chemicals that could sustain the combustion of the rocket engine. One of the two propellants is usually the fuel, something that stores a lot of chemical energy that could be released through burning. Fuels in rockets could either be kerosene, or methane, or even simple candle wax or baking grease. Anything that burns and releases chemical energy. The other propellant, equally as important as the fuel, is the oxidizer. Usually something containing very dense amounts of oxygen and helps the fuel release its energy quickly by speeding up the combustion. When you light a candle in the air, the oxidizer is the oxygen surrounding the candle. However, when you have a rocket engine, it needs to react much faster than a candle and it needs to be able to work in space. Therefore, a bipropellant rocket usually carries its own supply of oxidizer, usually liquid or gaseous oxygen, or a compound that contains a lot of oxygen. Now you know what a bipropellant rocket is, we can get into some of the subcategories regarding how the fuel and the oxidizers are stored. The most common ways are to have either both the fuel and the oxidizer stored and fed into the rocket engine as liquids, making what we call a liquid fueled rocket, or to have one of the components, such as the fuel, being stored in the combustion chamber of the rocket engine as a solid, and the other component being fed into the combustion chamber to react, making what we call a hybrid rocket engine. Hybrid, hence part liquid and part solid. Usually the solid component is the fuel and the liquid component is the oxidizer because oxidizers such as liquid oxygen store better at a liquid state and fuels such as plastics and paraffin wax stores better at a solid state. Now we can get into more detail on how hybrid rocket engines work with the help of a cross-sectional diagram of a simple hybrid rocket engine. Let's start with the liquid propellant, in this case, the oxidizer. And it's sitting in a closed tank with an outlet to the combustion chamber. The oxidizer could also be a gas for smaller rockets, but liquids get more density. To control the flow rate, of the oxidizer into the combustion chamber, a valve is usually implemented. And to force the oxidizer into the combustion chamber, when the combustion chamber is at a high pressure, a inert gas is 
is usually used to pressurize the oxidizer tank to force the oxidizer into the combustion chamber. For gas oxidizers, this is usually not needed because the gases are already stored under pressure. Another way to get the oxidizer into the combustion chamber is to use pumps. The pumps can be powered by capping off some exhaust gases to power a turbine that spins the pump, or it could also be powered independently by an electric motor, or even in some cases, an internal combustion engine such as the hybrid rocket engine being used on the Bloodhound SSC upcoming land speed record vehicle. Then, the oxidizer enters the combustion chamber through the injector on the top. A typical injector looks like a round shower head with many small holes for the liquid to enter. This is so that the droplets of the liquid oxidizer will be as small as possible, so it would mix better with the fuel and evaporate quicker for better combustion. A smaller hybrid rocket using a gaseous oxidizer does not need such an intricate design. The solid propellant component, in this case the fuel, is inside the combustion chamber. When the combustion chamber is full of oxidizer, this creates a really oxidizer rich environment for the fuel to burn very, very quickly and generate large amounts of hot gases. And there's also a hole down the middle of, this of the fuel. This is so that the oxidizer can enter and pass through so the entire grain of fuel can combust. And more importantly, the hot gases generated by the combustion of the fuel can start pushing towards the nozzle and exit the nozzle. The nozzle of the rocket engine is one of the most important components. When the hot exhaust gases enter the nozzle from the combustion chamber, it is kept at a high pressure and a low velocity by this bottleneck throat. However, when the gases pass through the throat, the nozzle opens up into either a cone or a bell shape. This allows for the gases to expand and convert much of its heat and pressure into speed and kinetic energy going downwards by deflecting off of the nozzle wall, creating this uniform downward flow that will generate thrust. However, for a nozzle to convert most of that pressure, it needs to have a high expansion ratio, which is the ratio between the throat here and the nozzle exit. When you have this high expansion ratio, there is space for this high pressure gas to open up and convert much of its pressure into kinetic energy. However, it is not a very good idea to make an engine with as large a nozzle exit as possible for engines that operate within the atmosphere. This is because as the exhaust gases continue to expand in the nozzle, the spacing between the molecules get greater and greater, much like how these lines get farther and farther apart. This makes the pressure drop continuously as the gases go down the nozzle. And at some point in this very large nozzle, the pressure of the exhaust gases will be less than the pressure of the surrounding air. This will cause trouble because the air will rush in from the side and break the adhesion of the exhaust gases to the nozzle wall, making the flow inside the nozzle extremely turbulent and unstable. This could lead to combustion instability and even the destruction of the engine itself. Therefore, the most efficient nozzle in the atmosphere must make the exhaust gases match with the atmospheric pressure at the exit so that as much of the pressure and heat is converted into velocity as possible before the pressure drops below the atmospheric pressure. However, this doesn't really apply for space-based nozzles, because in space there is no atmosphere to go into the nozzle and cause this combustion instability. Therefore, you want a nozzle as big as you can carry. Now we know the inner workings of a hydro-rocket engine, how the liquid propellant 
is forced by either an inert gas or a pump through the valve at the ejector into the combustion chamber, where it mixes with the solid propellant and combustion happens, and how the nozzle converts the high-pressure combustion gases into a stream of high-speed combustion gases going out in this direction. However, some of you might still be wondering, how does throwing gas in this direction generate a thrust in the other direction, which propels the rocket? In short, rockets use Newton's third law of motion, how every action has an equal and opposite reaction. When the exhaust gases inside a rocket engine expand, so imagine a nozzle here, when the exhaust gases expand, they get pushed outwards. The nozzle of the rocket actually exerts a force on the gases, and this is a downward force. However, according to Newton's third law, there will be an equal and opposite force exerted upwards by the gases on the nozzle, which propels the rocket. And because rockets only exert the force and receive its reaction, from the exhaust gases, rockets do not need to push against the air, like propellers or jet engines, which means they can work in space or any atmospheric environment. A good demonstration of this is if you would sit on a rolling chair with a bowling ball in your hand. If you push the bowling ball in one direction, you will get launched in the other direction. And the bowling ball isn't going fast enough or isn't big enough to push against the air, demonstrating that it's Newton's third law pushing you back. Now you know the fundamental workings of a hybrid rocket engine. If you are interested to experiment with one yourself, please consider watching the second part of our series, where we do an in-depth breakdown of our own small-scale hybrid rocket engine and discuss any risks and safety precautions. Thank you for watching.